Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be looking at a press release from Red Hat in regards to what they're going to do about CentOS right after this. So the press announcement came out through the enterprise blog. So uh, I went out to the developer site and saw this. It's a new year, new Red Hat Enterprise Linux programs, easier ways to access RHEL. And the, the first couple of lines of the post say, this post highlights new, simplified, and low. And then there's a slash, which usually I, I uh, read as or. So low or no cost options for deploying RHEL. These are the first of many new programs, and then this last sentence makes no sense, to immediately go to the program that interests you. So I assume they, <laughs> I don't know what that means. But uh, there are two no-cost programs that they talk about, but nowhere in this article they talk about the low-cost ones. I think probably they're just not prepared to talk about those yet. So as you know, in December 8th of last year, <laughs> so good to say that about 2020, isn't it? Uh, Red Hat announced that there was a major change that CentOS Linux was going away and that CentOS uh, Streams was going to become the upstream development platform for RHEL. And that they have, like I said, it's only fair to say that CentOS Streams was always planned to be that. I mean, I've seen announcements that predate IBM's uh, buying out of Red Hat that this was intended. So there's no surprise here, although whatever whatever broken uh, thought process that's been going on inside of Red Hat that makes them think that CentOS Streams is a viable production release is just escapes me. But uh, they're trying to they're tr they're trying to rectify that with these announcements today. So let's just go through them. Uh, so the first one is. The no-cost rel for small production workloads. So, as you know, there's a Red Hat developer program which allows you to have one hardware release and then up to 16 virtual machines and or, I think it's the way it's written. So, um, that has changed. Well, not yet. It will be changed before February the 1st, according to the bottom of this article. So, what they're intending to do here is if you have a Red Hat developer program subscription, which you can get for free, all you have to do is sign up. Uh, you can use that subscription in up to 16 production workloads, and those don't have to be on-prem. You can also install those in the cloud. So if you have uh, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, or Microsoft Azure, I th now it doesn't say that these are the only ones. It just says that on major public clouds, including those. So, uh, and... Uh, I don't know if there's any restrictions, like if you were to host it on, I don't know, Linode or something like that. But uh, but you, of course, would just pay the hosting fees and then the license is yours to use. I mean, for free, you still get all the updates, and uh, but you don't get any support. That's all on you. So, yeah. Uh, the, the second one, which I find to be the most confusing... I have some questions about the first one too. I mean, but the second one is really the most confusing is we recognize the challenge for the development program is limited to individual developers and we're expanding this to make it easier for customers' development teams to join the program and take advantage of its benefits. The caveat here is, is that the customer has to have an existing subscription for RHEL. And then each of those developers that are on the team can, I guess, apply for a Red Hat developer program license, and <clears throat> I don't know what the details are. Does that each person give them additionally uh, 16 uh, production releases? Uh, is it just 16 total uh, production releases? And how does that impact the subscription? I, I, I just, there's so many questions in this one. I, I think they could have written a few more paragraphs and kind of flushed this out, but maybe they're still working on it. I don't know. Um, but again, you can deploy the the that subscription that that's in the developer program on AWS, Google Cloud, and Microsoft Azure. So, I guess maybe that answer is that we have at least one license that we know about that we can deploy. Deploy, but I don't know if that the sixteen come down automatically. It doesn't really say. It's kind of confusing. 
Uh, the other one is they, they realize that this isn't going to cover all the use cases. Yeah, no, it won't. <laughs> uh, CentOS Linux was used in, in, in large data centers as well as small. So it is not addressing the, the medium size or the large data centers. So they're working on a variety of additional programs and for to address these other use cases, and they'll have some updates in mid-February. You know, that's great. But <clears throat> Red Hat, I, the clock's ticking here. You have set a date to, to, to put CentOS into demise at the end of December of this current calendar year. So if, if none of us, if we're all waiting around on you to come up with all these programs for us to use, that's wasting our time. We have to make a decision. The decision has to be made whether or not we're going to stay on the RHEL platform. And the second decision we have to make is, are we going to move somewhere else? And then how long is that conversion or migration going to cost and take us in time, money and time? Because... Those two always go together. It's a funny thing about that. But, uh, yeah, so <laughs> let me turn off the mini-me. Um, so I guess they're really the – I guess I have two questions for you as people that are watching this. Would you trust Red Hat after what's happened to CentOS? Uh, now remember, the subscription models, you are signing up for those on each year. So – my developer program release is terminated in May unless I renew it, and I have to renew it in May, so which means I have to meet the requirements of the program in order to be able to use it, whatever those are going to be by then. But So those subscription requirements can change each year. So do you feel like that you are that you trust Red Hat enough that you would want to deploy take your applications off to CentOS Linux and deploy them on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, knowing that in a year's time that could change. Uh, they could start charging you or they could remove uh, that developer program altogether. Um, <laughs> I mean, anything could happen. Um, I guess that's really the question I have for you. I mean, I know how I'm going to answer that, but I'm, I'm not going to be negative in this. I, I think that I think personally Red Hat could have handled this a lot better than they have. And it looks to me like they're kind of stumbling with this one. Um, to me, that if you have a plan for a release and you know long, I mean, you should have a plan that's at least three to five years, right? At least. Now, in CentOS's case, that plan has to be 10. But if you know what that, that baseline is going to do in 10 years, then your plan should have reflected that you were going to end of life it at some point, right? And then when CentOS 7 was maybe midway through and you were working towards getting CentOS 8 out, maybe you should have told them that, hey, we're not planning on supporting this all the way out till the 2029. And instead of waiting until everybody who is working on CentOS 6 gets it finished just in time for it to go end of life at the end of November. And then eight days later, we're, we're, we're beset with this. <laughs> uh, and then you didn't mention, I mean, I saw some people talking about it from the Red Hat development team saying, hey, there's more coming here. Don't, don't worry. There's, uh, there, there's plans to do something. You shouldn't have announced that you were going to deep six CentOS Linux unless you had the plan in place. That's just plain common sense. If you're, uh, if you're, otherwise you just, you just, you look bad. I mean, personally, you just look like you don't know what you're doing uh, or you're just being impacted by a decision that came down from on high and you're reacting to it. And it's pretty visible that that is exactly what's going on. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But I would like to hear your comments in the, in the, uh, in the uh, comments below, what you think about all of this. Uh, Rocky Linux, I will tell you, they uh, are right now, they're, they've got some fundraising programs going. So they're trying to raise some money to help defray the cost of developing Rocky Linux, which is which will be a RHEL compatible release. Uh, as for me, I'm still working down my path as to what I'm going to do. I'm looking at a number, as you know, a number of uh, operating systems to replace CentOS or, or wait for Rocky Linux whatever's going to happen. Currently, Rocky Linux still, I just checked, they don't have a uh, 
a planned date yet, but I imagine they probably don't have a project plan put together yet either. So I guess we'll kind of, uh, I'm just going to continue evaluating and trying to estimate how long it's going to take me to move my code over. I don't think it'll be too bad, but you know, it's probably going to take a month or two. So I don't have a lot. I have some time, but not a lot. And I just feel sorry for the guys that have really large production shops worth millions of lines of code. They're in a bind. And, um, yeah, they may be they they may have to use the developer releases for a while. I, but if they have more than sixteen machines, I guess they're out of luck. So that's all I have for today. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you again real soon. And as always, bye for now. <laughs>